of our facility and I'll just give you that little movement there. So you can see we have some very large buildings on site. We are located on a pier. It's an 11 acre pier. So we are surrounded by water on three sides. Uh, we get a great view of Staten Island off here in the back. Uh, and then um, this is actually Jersey right across the way and then downtown Manhattan as well. So it's a it's a beautiful place, I would say. I'm, I'm not too sad to, to call it my, my workplace. Um, but a couple of other things you can see from uh, this image here, I'm just gonna move forward through all of these, my names and everything. You can see our solar array. So we have one of Brooklyn's largest solar arrays on top of this large building called our tipping floor. Um, and then we also have a wind turbine. It was the city's first installed commercial scale wind turbine. I'm not sure if it's still the only commercial scale wind turbine in the city, but uh, it was the first. So on the sunniest, windiest day, uh, we are able to uh, be powered by at least 15% by renewable energy. About 12.5% of the energy we use will come from the solar panels and about 25 can come from the turbine. Um, we definitely uh, have been looking into installing more solar panels. We have all roof real estate, um, but that's been a little bit of a process getting um, permits and permission to do so. So Sims Municipal Recycling, that is our company name. Actually, here you can see our, our pretty neat view of, uh, of downtown Manhattan and, and Brooklyn as well. So that is our company name. But the type of facility we are is what's called a material recovery facility. Um, I just wonder, has anyone heard of a material recovery facility? Like you can do it. Okay, we know. Okay, great. That's really helpful for me to know um, where you're at with that knowledge. So a MRF, a material recovery facility, sounds like you know but just to get us all on the same page, it's essentially a sorting facility for recycling. Because, you know, think of how we recycle in this country. We mix different materials into one state. They can't exactly be reprocessed in that state. So the job of the MRF is to sort out the different commodities, different types of materials. MRFs do this around the country. MRFs do this around the world. So <clears throat> this MRF, located in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. Our job is to receive, sort, and then sell New York City's recycling. But in New York City, um, we are only receiving residential and public school recycling, some private school, some city agency as well. But that's just how New York City sort of organizes its waste collection, right? The city collects trash and recycling from all homes, public schools, some private schools, some city agencies. But if you are a business, a restaurant, a store, an office building, you have to hire a private company, a private carter or hauler, they're called, to collect your waste and collect your recyclables. Those recyclables will not come to us. They will go on a similar journey as so what I'll talk about, but not through Sims. So even so we are only receiving, even though we're only receiving residential, we're still getting about a thousand tons of materials each day, which is, it's a lot as far as MRFs go. And that number has actually gone up, up uh, since COVID. Um, at one point in the summer, we were receiving about 1400 tons a day. Um, so it's it's been quite the change for us, um, but you know, we've, we've managed, um, though it has been an adventure. So that large tonnage actually makes us the largest MRF in the country by volume. So we are not your run of the mill MRF. We are very large. We are highly automated because we have such a diverse waste stream, right, that we're dealing with and such a large uh, amount that we're dealing with. So this uh, kind of other aerial of our facility, again, you can see the solar panels there on top of what's called our tipping floor. That's where we receive recyclables. Uh, you can see the wind turbine again, you can see the full pier, and you can also see many barges tied up on the side of the pier. So this is a main way that we move recyclables through the city. Um, the majority of the materials that we sort will come to us via barge, and that's a reason that we selected this waterfront location. So we are down here in Sunset Park, 
we are this larger orange dot down here, but we are again receiving from all over New York City. So trucks that are collecting recyclables, you know, up here in the Bronx or upper Manhattan or Queens, they certainly aren't going to drive all the way down to Sunset Park, Brooklyn. You know, anytime the city- In the 90s and early 2000s, I used to spend literally 100% of my free time making and- Ooh. That was interesting. <laughs> there was like a commercial break for a second. Um, so uh, trucks, are, you know, anytime that the city can utilize barges or, or rail for transporting waste, they're going to do so. So Sims actually has two transfer facilities, one in Hunts Point, the Bronx, one in Long Island City, Queens, where DSNY trucks or Department of Sanitation trucks will consolidate, the recyclables will be loaded onto a barge and continue down this orange line to us in Sunset Park. And this smaller blue dot over here, that's actually another MRF operated by SIMS. It's a smaller MRF. Um, it's much older than our Brooklyn facility, but they receive, uh, they continue to receive and sort Staten Island's recyclables and some of Lower Manhattan as well. So still SIMS, uh, but separate facility. And our glass plant that I'll tell you about um, in a moment is also over there at that Jersey City compound. It, it is a smaller MRF there, but it's a very large compound pound with the MRF, the glass plant, uh, and a metals, a Sims metals facility as well. So just to sort of place the MRF in the recycling process um, briefly, because I think you might be familiar with this, which is great, but again, just to get us all on the same page. So the MRF is the sorting facility. We sort the materials out into their respective categories and then sell them to the appropriate reprocessor, right? Metals will go to a smelter, plastics will go to a plastic reclaimer, paper and glass go to paper or glass mills and so on. And that's really the point where the materials are prepared to be something new. That's not even necessarily where they're fully made into whatever it is they will be next. The materials are broken down, maybe cleaned, maybe melted again, depending on the material, and then put into kind of like a, a baseline form where they can then be sold to a brand or a manufacturer and then used, then made into a new product or a new package. And that, you know, that sort of purplish bluish dot is a very, very important step in the process that, you know, consumers and residents and participants in recycling programs, we don't always think about. We don't always think, okay, all this stuff I throw in my recycling bin, someone has to buy it. There has to be demand for it because if there's not, it's really as good as trash. If there's not a company that wants to buy that stuff and use it in their products or packaging, then it's not truly a recyclable item or material. So hopefully brand owners buy the materials, they use it in their products or packaging, sell it back to the consumer who hopefully is still able to recycle the item. Uh, and then of course they will, once they do recycle it, which hopefully they do, it will be collected by their municipality or hauler or whoever's job it is to pick up their waste, who will then bring the recyclables back to the MRF and the journey continues. And that's the process if all goes well, if all pieces are in place and if the material is actually recyclable. Of course, there are many potential barriers. Any questions about anything thus far? Great. Uh, yes, could I ask a question about your location? Sure. Because you're surrounded by water and I assume with the wind turbine, you have a lot of wind. How do you avoid water pollution? How do we avoid materials falling in the water? Yes. Yeah, so there are a few things we do. So the barges are surrounded by netting. So that will sort of keep the materials on the barges. And then when we unload the barges, we use a spill plate. So um, it's actually quite remarkable to watch the cranes when they lift up this giant spill plate and then move, you know, they like dump the recyclables off the spill plate into the pile and then they move this giant piece of metal around so that it is sort of halfway over the barge and then halfway over the tipping floor. Um, 
So they're, again, as they scoop materials up, they're moving over the spill plate. So if anything drops, it falls onto the plate. And then we also have around, um, around our pier and around the entrance to our facility, we have big floating booms. So if materials do fall into the water, they sort of get caught and we can fish them out um, so that they don't float out farther into the water. Um, and, but then I also have seen our guys on the little dinghy boat, like if something big does get into the water and does get out, I have seen our guys like out there in their little dinghy boats pulling it, um, pulling it out of the water. But that being said, I, I know things once in a while will fall into the water, you know, and that's a, that's just a challenge of being a waterfront city and a waterfront facility. Um, but those are the techniques we use to, to avoid that as much as possible. Oh, and we also had, I'll, I'll show you this when I show you the, a picture of the inside of the tipping floor, but we have netting that will hold the materials inside the tipping floor. Cause yes, it can get very windy and the loose materials can blow around. So I'll, I'll be sure to point the netting out as well. So another quick question, is anyone in New York City right now? I never know with Zoom. Okay, cool. Okay, the people I can see, can, can you do a Zoom hand if you're in New York City? like put up the little yellow hands or thumbs up or something. Okay, a few. Uh, okay, cool. I feel like someone's clapping. Yay, New York City. Um, so I can't do one of these presentations and not review what we recycle in New York City. But since some of you are might be elsewhere, I will also talk about, you know, common trends of, of what tends to be the case in other programs as well. And common similarities or differences from recycling program to recycling program because it is different depending on where you are in the country, in the world, in the state, in the county sometimes. Um, recycling programs differ because you know different locations have different needs and different capabilities. So everyone can't, you know, all programs, all areas can't operate the same at this time. So in New York City, we have what's called a dual stream recycling program, meaning residents are to separate their recyclables into two bins. Much of the country operates single stream recycling programs where all of these materials go into one bin. I'm actually, you know, full disclosure, I'm not even in New York right now. I'm in California. It's very sunny and nice outside. Sorry, guys. Um, but I am, you know, there's single stream recycling here. I can't tell you how difficult it is for me to put my paper in the same bin as the metal glass plastic. But in New York City, we separate it out. So in the blue bin, in New York, we accept four types of materials, metal, anything that's metal, anything from a tiny bottle cap or key to a large refrigerator or air conditioner, anything that is mostly metal, you may recycle in New York City. We have the ability to sort it, process it and sell it, so we will take it. Many recycling programs accept only soda cans and soup cans. Some might also accept aluminum foil, but generally wherever you are, if you have a recycling program, they'll, as far as metal, they'll take your cans at least. Glass is the second material in New York City and pretty much anywhere that takes glass, it's bottles and jars only because the companies buying the glass from us, they are making bottles and jars. So that's the type of glass they need. You cannot go mixing heat resistant glass you know, like a coffee pot or like a Pyrex pie tray that you put in the oven. You can't go mixing that with bottles and jars. It's not going to melt in the same way. It could damage the furnace, um, which is a large piece of expensive, you know, equipment. So bottles and jars only. And then cartons are the third item. Many programs don't accept cartons. Um, this is a low value item and it's multi-layered, right? It's paper and plastic and some cartons have a layer of aluminum in them as well. So that's more work to pull all of those materials apart and reprocess it. So cartons can be a challenging item, but in New York City, we do accept them. Uh, and then rigid plastic. So in New York City, you may put any rigid or hard plastic into your recycling bin. Any plastic that keeps its shape, you know, when you set it on the counter, it doesn't just sort of deflate or fall over. Um, but many programs 
only want bottles and jugs, you know, like water bottles and like milk jugs or detergent jugs, because those are the plastics that have the most consistent market. They're easiest to sort for, they're easiest to sell and reprocess. But in New York City, all rigid plastic. Any questions? Um, what do you do with the like people? <laughs> I've accidentally put in plastic bags before. Oh. <laughs> this is a whole thing. Just stop and the you know goes on flame uh, goes on fire or something. I mean, yes, the whole thing explodes. No, the whole thing can explode if you if you put batteries in there. So never do that. Um, and hopefully you know that. I'm sure you know that. Uh, as it says here in the in the metal section, no batteries. The plastic bags won't necessarily explode at all, but they can definitely get quite tangled up uh, in the equipment. Um, and you know, we receive. It's estimated we receive about thirty three zero tons of plastic bags and plastic film per day. And we just have to throw it out. Um, so that's just more feet, more cost to us because we pay for, um, you know, for our waste, we pay for what we have to landfill. Um, so if you, if you want to recycle your plastic bags and your soft plastic, many states have take back programs where you can take it back to like Target or Walmart or Stop and Shop or um, other larger stores like that. Uh, I know that's been a little bit challenging during COVID, but that should start back up if it hasn't yet. Uh, and then I just see, so food contamination someone is asking about. So on these materials, the metal, glass, hard plastic, and cartons, it's really best practice to clean your recyclables before you put them in the bin. That being said, in New York City, if there's a little bit of food waste left on them, it's okay. Um, some recycling programs might be a bit more strict because their buyers might be a bit more strict. You know, whoever's buying the stuff from them might say, no, we need it to be clean because that's what our, our equipment needs. Um, different places, different facilities will have different um, abilities and so different restrictions. Um, clean it out, but don't waste water is what I say to New Yorkers. Um, aluminum foil or plastic that still has food on it. Yeah, um, Hillary, again, in New York City, it's not a huge deal, but best practice to clean it a little bit. You know, you don't want to attract little friends to your recycling bin. You don't want to attract pests. Um, how do you review the numbers of plastic items and packaging? So if you're asking uh, Summer about how we review them at Sims, I'll show you in a moment how we sort through the different plastics. In New York City, um, we don't ask residents to, to look at the numbers on plastics. Again, we just say all rigid plastic, but that is a way that also some recycling programs will say to residents, we only want number one and number two. So some programs do expect residents to you know, be finding that little, uh, uh, resin code, the number inside the um, the recycling symbol, which is so confusing because everyone sees that and they think, oh, it means it's recyclable. And that's, that's not what it means. It's just telling you the type of plastic that it is. So a little frustrating for recyclers. Um, in NYC, is it better to have the mindset when in doubt, recycle it? No, when in doubt, throw it out. Everywhere is the mindset, not just in New York City, but everywhere. When in doubt, throw it out, sadly, sorry. But it's just because wish cycling, wish cycling, right? You can imagine what that is. Uh, it, it's become a big problem. Um, again, if we get trash in the recycling stream, it can be problematic, it can be dangerous. Uh, and you know, you'll know, you see the inside of our facility in a moment. You can only imagine how some of these problematic materials can break things um, or harm this very expensive equipment or even harm the humans who are operating it. Um, so when in doubt, throw it out. But what I say, actually what I've started saying now is when in doubt, find out um, because it's, generally not, you know, we have the internet. It's generally not that hard to, to look online and see what your program accepts and, and how they want you to set it out. Um, why do resin codes matter in some MRFs and not in others? So, um, Kivia, it, it's not that they, it's not that the resin code matters, it's not the type of plastic matters because there are some types of plastic that have a strong market and some that do not. So the plastics that have a strong market are plastics number one, uh, PET, soda bottles, water bottles, 
plastic number two, which I think this is. No, it's not. I need to get a jug. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not at home with my props. Plastic number two, milk jugs, water jugs, detergent jugs. And then in some cases, plastic number five, which is like yogurt cups to go containers uh, and like gladware or other types of, of Tupperware. Um, those are just the ones that are the most common, the easiest to reprocess and have the most steady consistent market. Um, how could you separate different plastics to recycle? Uh, I will show you how we separate different plastics at our facility very soon, Charlene. Um, styrofoam is trash in New York City. Trash, do trash, trash. It was deemed non-recyclable in New York City. There are some few and far between programs that do accept styrofoam, um, but we do not have a program for that in the city. And many places in the states are actually starting to ban styrofoam. It's banned in New York City, most forms of it, and it is going to be banned in New York State. That legislation did pass. Uh, I think it's set to begin in 2022 uh, or something like that. You learn to do it by number in the Netherlands. Yeah, different places, uh, some are gonna do it differently, sadly. <laughs> that just makes it so much simpler, not at all, um, but different places have different approaches. What about mixed materials, like something that is plastic and metal combo? So Hillary, mixed materials are problematic for recycling. You know, you see on this, and then I'll, I'll just go ahead and pop up the green bin as well, but you, you'll see this is mainly, um, you know, homogeneous materials. We don't have things that are multi-layered except for the cartons. That's really the only multi-layer material that has sort of made its way uh, into the acceptable items. Things that are multi-layered are harder to reprocess and so they often end up as waste, unfortunately. Um, Charlene, because I know we put all different plastics into the same uh, bin, I just wonder how the operation and their cycle, yes, you'll see. Uh, so some places will do it manually and some will do it through automation. Oh yeah, this is always the hot slide with all the questions, by the way, I should have said that. So I heard polypropylene is now recyclable. Um, polypropylene is recyclable, it is accepted in some places, but um, not, not all. Some places it is not. So it's a check locally material. You have to check your, um, your program, but at Sims, we absolutely do accept it. But the polypropylene coffee pods are so small, they're going to fall through and you'll, you'll see what I mean in a moment. The, the plastic coffee pods generally end up as waste. So Sally, when you say some material is banned in New York City, what if some imported products have those materials? Uh, does that mean they cannot be sold in NYC? Yeah, I, I, you know, I don't know how the city or state works that out actually, um, but I, th I think it's that shops are no longer allowed to, to import them and then sell them uh, and utilize them. Um, I, I think that's where, where the law comes down. And then the, the store itself can be, um, can be fined if they're found to be, to be breaking that, that law or that regulation. Like with plastic bags, um, if stores are, are caught giving out plastic bags, they can be fined by the Department of Environmental uh, Conservation in New York State. Okay, so that was a nice run of questions there. So blue bin, green bin, so much simpler, paper and cardboard. Any paper, any cardboard. Little bit of food waste is okay. Little bit of grease on that pizza box. Even a lot of bit of grease on that pizza box in New York City is okay. Just be sure to take the pizza out of the box. See, sounds obvious, but see people mess that up a lot. Okay, one more question from Sue. How much non-recyclable material do we receive? Good question. Wondering how well-informed residents are. Some cities don't have the most transparent policies or don't provide enough education. Yeah, I mean, I would say in a lot of cities, the education is out there. It's just not, as a resident, you have to go and find it. Um, you know, the recycling program is really convenient. They come right to your house, but the educators don't come right to your house. You, you as the resident have to go out and, and figure it out. Um, so in New York City, about 20% of what we receive at Sims uh, is contamination, unfortunately. And that number has gone up uh, during the pandemic. It might even be a little more than 20%. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> I'm seeing Julia's face, I'm not sure if it's a reaction to what I just said, but that's how I feel too. It's a lot and it's gone up. Um, it's, it's, it's not ideal, it's not great. 
a lot of that is bowling balls though. So um, everything else goes into the trash. What a nightmare, yes. Everything else uh, other than these six materials will be a trash item. However, for a while in New York City, we had this brown bin program. We had an organics, a compost program. It wasn't citywide, it wasn't mandatory, but yeah, yeah, if you feel queasy, I know Sue, it's, it's gonna be okay, we'll figure it out. Um, so the brown bins we were putting in anything compostable, any food scrap could go in the brown bin, any food soiled paper, any compostable plastic could go in that brown bin. Um, but the program was very expensive for the city and participation rates were low, low, low. So unfortunately, with the budget constraints coming from COVID, um, the city did decide to temporarily, temporarily suspend the brown bin program, um, which is a shame because, you know, the food scraps make up a third of our waste stream. And that's pretty consistent no matter where you are. Food scraps are going to make up about a third of whatever you throw away or compostables, food scraps, yard waste, and food filled paper. So I really encourage people wherever you are, find a way to compost. In New York City, there are drop-off locations, like a lot of community gardens are still doing it and they, they won't accept maybe as wide an array of materials as we could put in that brown bin. But they are accepting a lot of, you know, vegetables and, and eggshells. And I, I just encourage you to compost if you can. Um, if we can make compost the norm, we're going to be in a, moving in a good direction as far as waste management. Mia, did you have a question? I see your hand up. Good. Okay. No, sorry. I don't know why that's up. Okay. Okay. Just saying, hey. Hey. All right, so if you are confused in New York City, you can go to nyc.gov slash sanitation. I suggest going to this website anyway, if you haven't already, there is a lot of great information there um, just about uh, waste management, not just for recycling, um, metal, glass, plastic, but textiles, electronics, um, a lot of useful stuff. And if you are elsewhere, check your municipality's website for trash and recycling, you know, become informed so you know. Uh, Joshua, I hear you. The compostable utensils are confusing to me sometimes, if not clearly marked. Does the compostable utensil screw up your plastic stream? Oh yeah, we don't want compostable utensils in the recycling stream because we don't have a market for it. So we're not sorting for it. It doesn't cause a huge problem for us per se. It's just tra It's going to come to us and end up as trash because we're not pulling compostable plastics out of the waste stream. But <laughs> I, I, I'm all for innovation, you know, great creating new materials and new ways of, of managing waste. Um, the, the trick with the compostable plastics is they can only break down in um, industrial scale composting facilities and not cities are starting to, to have these programs and, and utilize uh, these facilities. It, it, it's just we're not quite there yet. So we it's like the whole system isn't in place yet. I know we're kind of catching up, but just know for you, if you are able, if you do have a composting program that accepts compostable plastics, great. Just know if it's compostable, it will say compostable. I don't know if you can read that. If it doesn't say compostable, it's not. Hopefully that's clear enough. Um, okay, a couple more questions. I feel like I've seen cardboard paper recycling collected on the street in clear plastic bags. Is this the default collection method and do the bags get landfilled? So I will talk to you about the plastic bags. That is how we manage collections in New York City. Much of the country does not use the bags, um, but it's what we do in New York City. I'll tell you why in a moment. Uh, you do vermicomposting. Awesome. In your apartment. Uh, just as a tip for people that find composting difficult now. Yes. Uh, and that's great. If you're able to do that, I would love to do that. Uh, maybe under my sink because I think my pets would get into it. But, you know, there, there are ways to just do it yourself. If you have, actually, I have a friend who's staying with who we were bubbling right now, who just had a little bucket on her fire escape, you know, that she would just do compost with, right, right in Queens, right in New York City. Um, so there are ways if, if you have the time and, and the ambition to do it. I really, I encourage you to explore that. So 
after the thing goes in the bin, now we get into the good stuff. Uh, what happens next? So this is the point in the tour where we would walk from this part of our facility, our admin center and our um, recycling education center. We would walk from here across this pedestrian walkway into our tipping floor this much larger building. So this is the building that had the solar panels on the roof, if you remember from the aerial. Uh, also, as we walk over, you know, we get this great view again of Manhattan, downtown Brooklyn, you see Jersey City, and this is us going over the the walkway again. There's the Statue of Liberty. She's super small, but she's in the background there. And then we walk towards the tipping floor. I'm just going to make it so I can share sound as well. As you start to walk in, start to hear the sounds in the background, and then you kind of smell this really unique smell. The kids say it smells like pickles. And then you walk in and you see the pile. So this is a huge room. Uh, you know, the ground is about 30,000 square feet. The roof is about 60,000 square feet because half of it goes over the canal that the barge is actually entered so that we can unload the barges on. So this pile, you know, it is not even half uh, of, a, not even half a day of New York City's recycling. And we'll, we'll go back and we'll see that pile again soon. But materials travel to Sims. They arrive uh, in the tipping floor on that pile, either by way of trucks, Department of Sanitation trucks that are operated by the city, so trucks that collect recyclables in Brooklyn, you know, they'll just bring them right to the facility because they're in the vicinity. And then again, recyclables collected farther away will come to us on barges and the barges are operated by Sims. There are barges, they'll be pushed down the East River by tugboats. And you can see the netting around the barges there as well. And then materials arrive. So in the background, I'll turn a little. that full experience because when you see it in person and you enter this room it's like it's very very loud and people always ask me questions and I have to shout at them um, but again this is where we receive materials the crane is unloading the barges tossing material onto the pile uh, so just quickly I see from Sally my trick with compostable plastic is to save them and bring them with me if I'm ever going to visit whole food and sweet green salad bar they have a composting bin for them that's good to know um, that's really good to know, because um, I guess they have, they're probably giving out that compostable wear, so they have a bin for it as well. Cool. I won't remember that. All right, so again, this room is called our tipping floor. I can show you more of it. So there's the pile. There's the mountain of materials, less than half a day of New York City's recycling. Um, but if you look closer, you can see it's actually two piles, because remember, we separate our recyclables into two bins. So we have the paper pile and the metal glass plastic pile. And again, at Sims, we are receiving 100% of that metal glass plastic, MGPC, metal glass plastic cartons. And we receive about 50% of the city's recycled paper. And now the paper has already been sorted, right? It's already in its own place. So we just consolidate it onto larger trucks. We send those larger And at the paper mill, so this is a picture from, uh, sorry, it says my internet connection is unstable. Hopefully I'm not freezing too much, uh, but this is, kind of a backup uh, pulper, like a holding tank at Pratt Industries, the paper mill on Staten Island that receives most of New York City's recycled paper. And then this is their finished product. You know, they're making these giant these recycled paper. They also uh, on site in Staten Island have um, a box making plant where they make pizza boxes out of New York City's recycled paper. Not all the recycled paper goes into pizza boxes. They sell some of the rolls as well, but some of them are used for, for pizza. So that's the paper, but the metal glass plastic cartons, we use this giant sorting system. Um, and I do like to sort of switch how we're using our brains for a moment and just ask what this looks like to you. Like, does it remind you of anything or look like anything to you? To me, it looks like that childhood game mousetrap. 
mousetrap. You know, I haven't heard that in a long time. It's good to hear that again. And then Maya said shoots on ladders. Yep, totally. Car track. Yeah, I've heard that. Some kids have said it looks like a Hot Wheels track. Assembly line. Luggage sorters. Yes. People have said, air, kids have said airport before as well. Or some kids said shopping mall once. And I thought, oh my gosh, such a stressful shopping mall. But could be. So this is what it looks like in person and what it sounds like. So all in all, it's two and a half miles of conveyor belt. It's operating 24 hours a day, five, sometimes six days a week. So that is three shifts a day. Um, two shifts a week, however, are devoted to cleaning and maintenance just to keep it running and to get all the jams out. So here's how it works. First step, we need to load the system. So a front end loader pushes materials into the entry point right there. Can I list what's real contaminated element for the paper, paper recycling stream? Um, so they say at the paper mill, Charlene, that they don't receive a lot of contamination. They said they receive only five, I think it's at least 10% though, but they're, they're saying around 5% contamination at, at the paper mill. Um, but yeah, anything really for them, anything that's not paper is not ideal. But you know, you, you said something like oil, I think, and it, yeah, that could definitely damage the, um, the strength of the paper and the quality of the paper. Uh, so just... Anything that can affect the paper fibers, it can be problematic for them at the paper mill. But solids, you know, their pulper and their process is going to screen out non-paper items. So like staples, tape, uh, the little plastic windows on envelopes, those aren't big problems for them. They're able to screen that out. But something that can really get into the paper and damage the quality of the fibers, that can be more problematic for, for paper mills in general. So we're pushing materials into the entry point and then our view has now flipped. Those materials travel up this initial conveyor belt here. And now our view will flip again and we see the liberator. So at our facility, we have a liberator, very serious sounding, because in New York City, we collect recyclables in clear plastic bags. Many programs do not, but in New York City, we just don't have space for large sealable bins to effectively contain materials so they don't fly into the environment, you know, when while they're waiting for collection. So collection day looks like piles of plastic bags. Again, that's to contain the materials and to make them easier to collect. We also don't have trucks that pick up the recyclables and throw them in. The, we don't have automated trucks. We have humans picking this stuff up and, and dumping it into the truck. So the Liberator is a slow speed shredder that rips the bags open. We're gonna zoom in on the Liberator now. So when materials, enter, they go through the shredder, which is right there, and then everything falls through and drops onto this conveyor belt. The contents and the bag itself, and they will all be sorted. We sort plastic film from the mix. We create plastic film bag, or plastic film bales rather. So like all the plastic bags that we receive that we are supposed to receive and that we are not supposed to receive but do anyway uh, we do bail them up um, but there's not a consistent market for them so often they end up as waste uh, what about gift wrap uh, can be asked and tape on the gift wrap is Pat Pratt able to sort that I mean yeah j just think with paper again anything that's not paper is not ideal Pratt is a large paper mill so they have more capabilities to sort out contaminants uh, than a smaller paper mill might have. So in New York City, yeah, a little bit of the, the tape on the gift wrap is fine, but a smaller mill that might, might cause problems with them depending on their capabilities. Sorry, going back, no problem, Joshua. Does LA have a more high-tech separator sorter? Oh, I would love to know. Uh, I don't. Um, I don't actually know, <laughs> or are more humans doing it? Why does one bin work for that? So in LA, I believe they are, they are single stream. Most of California is single stream. So it just means that their MRF is going to have more equipment early on in the process to sort out the paper. So for us, the first material we sort out is going to be glass and we use screens to sort out glass. Other MRFs, 
before sorting out the glass or anything else, they would probably sort out the paper. They would use slightly different screens to sort out the larger paper, like the cardboard from the smaller pieces of paper from the uh, heavier three-dimensional materials. Um, yeah, it's just different capabilities at, at the MRF, um, different buyers and a different material stream. You know, I'm going to go out on a limb and say we I think we receive more tonnage, a higher tonnage than they do in, in L.A. So um, if we were a single stream MRF, if we had to sort paper as well, we'd be sorting double the tonnage of what we we're already sorting. Um, so that would be a much larger MRF and a lot more technology. Um, but I bet Joshua, you can, I bet you can find a video of, of the Murph that sorts all these recyclables. Um, so the disc screens, these metal rods spin. As they spin, materials roll over the top. So you can see plastic and metal rolling over. You can see a lot of plastic bags that should not be there, but there they are. So as materials roll over the disc screens, the glass hits into those metal disc screens and breaks into small pieces. The small pieces fall in between the disc screens and are caught by another conveyor belt below and taken out the back. So this is a great way for sorting out glass. However, maybe you have thought, oh, wait a minute, everything that's small is going to fall through those disc screens, and it is. So this is one reason we say, you know, leave plastic caps on plastic bottles, all plastic stays with plastic so that it doesn't fall through and end up in the wrong stream, end up with the glass. Um, but that glass is headed for our glass plant. Remember that's at the Jersey City compound where we are using magnets. So there's a magnet here on this conveyor that attracts all the ferrous metal from the glass stream. So these little bits of metal will be recovered. There is an eddy current or a reversed magnet that repels non-magnetic metal. I know they're very small pieces, but you can see some things flying over. That's non-ferrous metal being ejected from the glass stream. And then we do use technology that scans the glass by color and then air jets shoot the different colors into different places. So this computer scans it and then we'll sort so we'll have only clear or only brown or only green, which raises the value. Generally, we're only selling the, the clear glass or the flint to bottlers, um, the brown or green, depending on demand, it may or may not go to bottlers, uh, more likely it's going to be uh, used for construction projects. Okay, so Nespresso. Um, a while back, time is very strange right now, but definitely over a year ago, um, Nespresso invested in our facility. They invested in New York City because they're little Nespresso pods. They're like aluminum uh, with the coffee, with the, co the grounds inside. Uh, and they do have a, a take back program uh, where you can send all your pods back to them and they will recover the grounds inside in the pod itself. But they thought, well, let's make it easier for all New Yorkers. Let's start with New York City, the biggest city in the country. So they invested in our facility and they put in our glass plant a stronger eddy current and a special shredder that would shred the pods so we could remove the grounds. The downside for us is that we aren't able to recover the grounds. Uh, the coffee grounds do end up as waste when they come to us, but it's that level of convenience where hopefully more New Yorkers will participate, so more will be recovered. Um, and we are able to then sell and recover the, uh, the aluminum. So I don't know, there's so, like a cute little... <laughs> people that in New York City now you can put your Nespresso pods in the metal glass plastic container. Um, more companies should be putting it, yes, more companies should be investing in recycling and some are. Um, many are making commitments and are figuring it out. We're sort of in that turning point moment, moment now where more companies are, are jumping on board. I was thinking the same thing, color scanning. Oh wait, what did I miss? Optical sorting. Yes, and I will show you more about it in a moment, about optics. So, but first I'll show you how we sort metals. So now we're back at the Brooklyn facility. We have a large spinning magnet that pulls out all ferrous metal. And then we use an eddy current again, like a reverse magnet to repel the non-ferrous metal and shoot it, eject it from the stream onto another conveyor belt. And then for plastics, 
That's where we use optics at the Brooklyn facility. Oh, sorry, ballistic separator, also very cool. Check this out, it's like a party. And you can see softer two-dimensional items float to the top, but three-dimensional items roll back to the bottom. So that's how we sort contaminants like plastic bags and other plastic sheets and paper uh, from bottles and, and containers and three-dimensional stuff. Yeah, ballistic separator is fun. But optical scanners, so materials fly by on the conveyor belt and then they pass under, you can see this little line of light right here. So that's the optical scanner. It uses near infrared light to identify the chemical makeup of materials as they pass by. So when it finds what it's looking for, it turns on a jet of air at the end of the conveyor belt that then shoots that item over a barrier onto another conveyor. So optical scanners with near infrared light and then air jets, or compressed air is how we sort uh, all of our different types of plastics, cartons, and certain contaminants from our facility as well. Uh, yeah, optical sorters or optical scanners. Oh, look, we get to watch it again. So there's the light, that's where the scanning happens. And then like a fraction of a second later, some things will be shot up. There's a whole row of the valves for air jets. How accurate are those scanners? 90 to 95% accurate. So not perfect. So that's why our last step in our facility will be humans doing a final check, our quality control specialists. So they will remove whatever uh, is in the stream that does not belong, you know, raising up the, the quality of, of our bales. Some MRFs though, some MRFs will have humans as the first line of defense. For us, humans are the last line of defense. Everything, you know, goes over uh, through automation first and then then the humans come in. Uh, and then once materials have been sorted, they will dump into one of our bunkers. It's like a holding tank, you can think of it. And when the bunker is full, the front door will open as you see here and materials spill out. So that's our PET bunker and it, wow, it gets very full when it is full. And wow, that stuff just dumps out for like, it takes about three minutes for it to empty. And then the sorted materials will be fed to one of our balers where they will be compressed. So this is now, uh, this is HDPE or number two plastic coming out of the baler. And remember that is what we make at the MRF. You know, we're not cleaning materials, we're not reprocessing them, we're just sorting and baling. So some of the bales that we make, uh, these are the plastic bales we make. We do also make a, a bale of bulky plastics like buckets and tubs and um, even recycling. <laughs> bins. If you have a broken or shredded recycling bin, you can actually recycle it if it's plastic or metal for that matter. Um, but these are the plastics we are baling and selling. These are a couple of our metal bales, the ferrous tin and the non-ferrous aluminum bales as well. And they, of course, they all have different values uh, and those values can change. It is a volatile market, but aluminum tends to be very valuable and HDPE natural is very valuable right now. That value is really shot through the roof. There's a lot of demand and there's not a lot of it available. So it's very valuable. So the bales are then loaded onto either rail cars. That's how our tin can bales will leave Sims. Uh, quick question, does Sims get the material from bottle and can collectors at the grocery store? No, Kim B, that is, um, so anything that is taken to a redemption facility or back to a, a distributor or a store, anything included in the bottle bill uh, is another name for it, will not go to a MRF. That has to make its way just directly to a reprocessor, I believe. And I think the manufacturer or distributor has to assist in paying for that uh, transportation, but it, it sort of skips the MRF step in the recycling process. All right, and many of our bales are loaded onto trucks. These are carton bales. And then they leave Sims. So next step, the reclaimers and then the manufacturers, you know, those plastic water bottles, they're gonna be shredded and then pelletized and then might be used to make more water bottles, but probably will be used to make textiles like clothing or carpeting. That's a more common fate for um, plastic water bottles. So the cartons, poor carton, what's going to be recovered is that paper, probably all other parts are probably going to end up as waste. Uh, and often the paper inside cartons is used to make toilet paper. Metals can be recycled endlessly and they don't show any signs that they've been recycled. They don't degrade in quality, um, but they will be smelted, 
and then can be used to make a variety of metal products, you know, anything made of the same type of metal, basically. Uh, and then glass, clear glass will probably go to a furnace and be used to make another clear glass bottle or jar. But again, bottles and jars only. So that's recycling in 50 minutes. Um, but I do like to I do like to punctuate this message um, with the fact that, you know, recycling is good. Recycling is helpful. Please participate in your local recycling program. Please find out how your local program works and recycle right. Take five minutes, look it up, be empowered, get the knowledge. But just know that recycling is a small piece in a much larger pie. You know, in the waste management pie, re recycling is a little cute yummy piece. Um, reduction and reuse are much larger, much more impactful pieces. Um, and so I, I do hope that, you know, while we talk about recycling, you, you do keep in mind um, reduce, reuse. Reduce, reuse, recycle is not just a cute little catchphrase for kids to learn. These are practices for everyone to incorporate in their daily lives. That's what I have for you today. Is there any last questions? I have one minute. Or you're welcome to email me at any time also. Are labels or adhesives a problem? Pamela, they sure can be. So that's going to be a problem uh, in this stage. Um, for us actually at the MRF, labels that cover the entire bottle can be a problem because our scanners are going to see this plastic, the label, not this plastic. This plastic is PET, valuable. This plastic is probably like LDPE. We're not even scanning for that. So we could completely miss this giant PET bottle and that's just a shame. Um, but labels and adhesives, if they don't remove easily in this process, you know, chopping it up and then pelletizing it, they can cause problems, definitely. Um, what percentage of Sims expenses would you say is for trash? Ooh, you know, that's a thing that they don't tell me maybe because we don't share it. Um, trashing contaminated items, non-recyclables. You know, our, I think our, our largest expense is, is paying employees, I, I think, um, and, and then maybe managing the, all the large equipment. Um, but waste is definitely a big one as well, unfortunately. Does SIMS work with local, local policymakers? Absolutely, to help develop recycling legislation. Yes, yes, and yes. Specifically, the um, EPR bill. Absolutely, yes. We have been um, advocating for EPR for a long time. Tom Outerbridge is our general manager and our uh, sort of our, our advocate. Um, and he's been working with the Department of Sanitation as well to advocate for extended producer responsibility in New York State. There is some movement happening on that bill as well. So I, I definitely definitely do encourage you to, to follow it and, and support it in any way you can. Um, what materials don't have a market value at the moment that you think should be targeted for future development? Glass. Glass hat tends to have a low value and is very, it, it's expensive to move it. It's so heavy. So glass really has to operate in a local market. Um, and that can cause problems for it. And glass is endlessly recyclable and a precious material. Um, but the way we recycle glass in this country is maybe a little problematic, the, you know, breaking it um, when it could just be sanitized. But, you know, even keeping it intact and sanitizing it is, is going to require its own, you know, infrastructure and, and modes of transportation. It has to go to a facility to be sanitized and refilled. And, complicated or just not set up for that um, direct reuse of glass at this time. Do we work with, oh wait, where did that question go? Do we work with Walmart on their efforts to improve recycling? You know, I we don't work directly with them, but I certainly do attend many of their events and I do try to keep up to speed on, on what they're doing. They're working with the Association of Plastic Recyclers quite a bit. Um, yeah, I, what they're doing just does seem helpful. Absolutely. What materials don't have a market value? Oh, I said that already. Okay, great. Sorry that I missed the Walmart question. And then so sad because glass has been recycled since the Roman ages. I know it, it is really tragic. Um, so hopefully we'll get our act together with, with glass. Absolutely. Okay. The questions have seemed to stop. 
So I'll just put my email up one more time. Do feel free to reach out. If you know of anyone else that would benefit from a tour, we are offering tours for adults and students of all ages. We also offer corporate tours for packaging designers, which are like, th th those are do include a fee, but we do like detailed consultations with um, packaging or product designers, telling them what about what they're doing is not recyclable or problematic. Um, follow us on the social media. We post the educational stuff and, and fun tips and events as well. Ah, do you think the shrink label will be better than pressure sensitive? It can. So what's better about the shrink label is that there's generally no adhesive. It comes off so much easier once it's gotten to the plastic reclaimer. The problem with the shrink label is the sorting. Um, so if we can fix that sorting problem. Generally, um, the Association of Plastic Recyclers say that if well, if no more than 75% of the container is covered by a label, the scanner should be able to recognize it. So that's the 75% rule. You're all welcome so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. Um, and thank you for your interest. And please do stay safe and, and healthy and well and take care. And reduce, reuse, recycle. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing and have lunch. I think it's lunchtime. <laughs>